Uh, in this context, like uh, the, like rapid devastation of society, um, at one point uh, uh, there was a moment where where one generation, which uh, Joe advised me to tell, like it's an old millennials, start enroll their universities and started learning. Yeah, at universities uh, or at universities you would still find across the region like little islands of critical thought and that was the place where the new generation of Balkan left was born. For example in Serbia that was philosophy faculty at, uh, in Croatia as well. In, in Slovenia it was a f faculty of social sciences and so on. So at one point somewhere in the mid 2000s uh, when when the financial crisis also add up to the to the uh, to the whole uh, the, like a shitty situation, <laughs> uh, uh, the students were the ones or the left, the 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 the, the, the little um, uh, cells of the of the left critical thought. Uh, started actually to oppose or to try to articulate um, to articulate the alternatives. It was also the moment where uh, we went through this Bologna reform and when the uh, tuition fees was introduced and given the fact that so, uh, socialist society was were the, the societies with very high social mobility this actually the introduction of tuition fees uh, which were very high and non at not attainable for many uh, uh, for, for many working class people actually were tr we, we thought that they are, they are going to lock this this social inequality which were which, which we were witnessing and that was the moment where we start to engage in our immediate environment and to try to organize this content in the in the student movement and to and to fight for alternative and this is how uh, actually the new Balkan left came into the political scene. And since then, uh, uh, we are witnessing ever growing, the, uh, like the rise of the Balkan left, um, which is now, which now ended up in very successful stories, which, which you will hear about from, uh, from my friends and colleagues. And, yeah, so um, I would say that th there was at least three main phases of the left, of the in the in the in the development of the left. So in the first phase, um, like ten years ago, maybe uh, the left was mainly uh, engaged in in in, in intellectual work. Uh, the the main task was actually to oppose this uh, neoliberal ide ideological dominance and to, yeah, our main goal was to launch another narrative, that another world <laughs> could be possible, that alternatives to the austerity are possible, that alternatives to uh, privatizations are possible. And uh, we, given the fact that we all came from the student movement, our first uh, tasks were actually to develop the argumentation, to, well, to develop analysis and to try to insert it into the public. And we, I would say, we succeeded in that very much. Before, before the, the, the birth of the new left, the word, uh, uh, the word of capitalism didn't exist, so it was a normality. So uh, the, the word socialism was demonized. The word the collective was demonized. Trade unions were demon demonized. And this is something which we managed actually to shift um, in its, so, so to say, first phase of our intensive intellectual work and debates. In the second phase, uh, we started connecting each other, uh, with each other, like across the region. And that, that, that happened like, uh, at the same time when Syriza was also uh, uh, gaining the power. That was the moment like, when Occupy movement started and that was the moment where we started uh, actually connecting with each other and intensifying discussions among each other and uh, trying to be, uh, we, we were trying, we were starting to build a new international internationalist connection which were uh, due to the wars, especially in Yugoslavia, broken. Um, so in the second phase, uh, also, when we grew up from university, we started in, uh, engaging in um, 
in uh, social issues in other spheres. Uh, so we moved away from uh, from the student issues and um, started to uh, to tackle the uh, labor standards in other spheres. So uh, precarious status of cultural workers uh, uh, or uh, uh, or um, ever more uh, uh, lowering of the standards of industrial workers. We tried we tried to end to uh, to establish connections. Um, and connect struggles with trade unions and many others. And this, this was the phase where uh, New Balkan Left started to specialize in, uh, in, in, in different policy spheres, which led to, um, to uh, uh, some kind of conflicting uh, tendencies. One, from one side, it's, um, it, uh, it started a little bit, uh, we were getting we were getting um, experiences and also um, expertise, 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 <laughs> uh, expertise in others, others spheres of policies, uh, policies. But uh, at the same time, this has brought a little, uh, so one could say, a fragmentation of the left. And uh, in order to overcome this. Uh, uh, there was there were initiatives actually slowly the initiatives in uh, in uh, some of the countries started to uh, to think of uh, building a political organization which will then bridge again all these efforts of the left and we have here like with us like the the pioneers of the party building processes in Croatia and in Slovenia, and now um, we are we are witnessing the same similar development in Serbia as well and in other countries. So the left uh, is now uh, reaching to the moment of uh, developing or build, uh, building a political organization who could now represent uh, or fight for progressive uh, uh, progressive changes inside of the institutions. And uh, if I if I would uh, n uh, have to name a couple of successes of the left, um, then I would definitely mention the, the fact that uh, the left in Croatia managed to take over the power in, in its capital, in Zagreb, uh, and also the left in Slovenia, uh, who entered into the parliamentary uh, electoral politics already seven years ago, eight, eight years ago, and now uh, 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 is uh, a junior coalition partner, partner in the new government. And this gives the hope then that some of these negative uh, tendencies uh, in our region, which we, we, were, we were witnessing for 30 years, now can be reversed. And I, uh, I would uh, like to hand over to... Thanks so much, Anna. That was a great introduction. Yelena, how do you feel about standing up? I'll sit down if you want to sit down and, you, and we'll both I, stand I up. I actually have a backache, so I'll We're going to sit down. <laughs> great. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is just have uh, little chats with each panellist individually um, because we thought that might be easier uh, because we're talking across context and that before we come and have a broader discussion and then op open to the floor. Um, so Yelena, um, you know, you're a city, you're a city governor and now also an MP. Could you um, give us a little bit of an introduction to the specific uh, Croatian experience politically of these last few decades, uh, you know, from the... the <laughs> Just a decades. little <laughs> uh, up to the point where you know Mojimo is forming, and w what do we ne need to know to understand to understand Mojimo? <coughs> okay, I'll start with the 19th century, and then you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe not. Um, yeah. Uh, hi everyone. So I'm Jelena. Um, uh, I would stand up, but I really have a backache because I've been traveling uh, since. 4 a.m. this morning to arrive at this panel, so... <laughs> 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 um, so just to introduce Mojomo, um, and uh, what we call Zagreb is ours. So it's uh, basically we defined as a green uh, left progressive party. 
Um, and uh, to us, this is the core of who we are. So basically, uh, the the green issues are the, the have the same value to us as as you know the left, and this is very important for us to say. And uh, we assembled uh, we assembled as a group of people who've been fighting for uh, quite a long time uh, in uh, student issues, fighting for, for example, um, free and available education for everyone for labor issues, um, uh, for social justice, and uh, uh, for basically also like local issues, which I think are the basics of every type of politics. Um, so we assemble basically people from uh, those who care about their neighborhoods, to people who care about social democracy, to people who care about green issues. I have this, I don't know if I, um, yeah, it's something resonates really, um, um, I can hear myself echoing, so I don't know if uh, you can... Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay, this is way better. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we started as a, as a local platform, uh, a municipal one, uh, very much like similar platforms in, um, I don't know, uh, probably you heard about Grenoble in France, Barcelona and Comu and, and, and uh, similar platforms. So uh, we wanted to um, uh, basically change the way the politics is done to be as concrete as possible and to basically try to uh, change people's lives uh, for the better. This is what uh, drives us. And we have a pillar of uh, what we call the social justice pillar. We have a pillar of um, climate just transition and also a pillar of uh, um, equality, um, including gender equality and all types of equality. So this is basically uh, what what we do, we started as a movement party, which means that uh, we gather different, just active citizens wanting to, you know, wanting to make change. It's as, you know, simple as that, no, no more, no, uh, no less. And um, people recognize basically what we've been doing for 10 or more years. And they decided to give us their vote and that's how we entered the, um, the that's how we entered the local government. Um, and um, uh, to us, uh, the politics needs to be transformative, and that's you know what we are trying to do with the various types of policies. But to maybe I'll get back to that later. But just to an answer your question, maybe about the context of uh, of, of Croatia. Um, I mean, Croatia. Uh, everybody. I mean, maybe not everybody, but uh, it's uh, it's a post-socialist country in a, in a sort of a tra transition phase uh, in, that was in the transition phase in, in the 90s that suffered along with the global, you know, um, the global environment, the uh, consequences of the industrialization um, and high un un unemployment and uh, basically disruption and um, deregulation of social services, health services, um, uh, social care, so every, every type of, of what it really means uh, uh, of things that are really important to people. Um, and uh, also the deregulation of higher education, etc., etc. So this is where basically our politicization began, mine, to be exact, because we, as I said, gather people that were struggling for public goods, for example, um, uh, to preserve the public spaces, to you know, to um, um, to fight for union rights, etc. I, I started out as a person from a really small city in in Croatia that had a quite big uh, textile factory that went uh, uh, you know bankrupt during the transition phase, and uh, this is you know um, my uh, my time of politicization, I would say. Uh, so everybody knows about the 2008 and 2009 uh, financial crisis. It hit the Balkans as uh, as well in a really, in a really uh, bad way, where we transitioned from an industrial uh, society to post-industrial society, mainly based on services and and uh, the regulation of the labor market, with you know uh, also the fact that um, uh, the integration into the European political space, where you know. As a country on the periphery, the only way to be competitive is basically to devalue uh, labor force and the cost of uh, and the cost of labor, which has you know uh, marked our period of um, of the 2010s then uh, onwards. Uh, so in in 2017, basically uh, after a long period where we had like social democracy, which was not really uh, doing uh, much for you know for uh, for its definition <laughs> or who they were, we decided to you know to kind of form a party and um, uh, to rebuild the left. And what's uh, I mean, maybe we can share these experience. I think that we share these experiences 
that uh, the left in Croatia was quite young, so we didn't, because, th because the post-socialist, um, Croatia was a post-socialist country, um, uh, ev everything was like, uh, quite a, like, there was no structure that you could rely on, so we had to build everything anew, so we were like quite a new generation of people that entered institutions, um, that are trying to, you know, to, to change and reshape the institutions, to make them transformative, but really like, when we're talking about the Croatian left, I think that, uh, uh, the Croatian left green institutional politics, we are all, you know, very young. So um, this is something that maybe is distinct, distinctive of the, um, of the Balkan, uh, Balkan space. And so is uh, Moramo in, uh, in Serbia. They've been um, established uh, some, uh, a while after us and also the Slovenian left. We've all been part of the same political space. So, um, so I think, yeah, the, um, maybe a defining feature of the left would be that uh, it's, it's, we have to build everything anew. Brilliant. Government by millennials. Um, I am a millennial, I'm a millennial, right? Are you a millennial? I, I think we're all millennials. <laughs> when, does, when does millennial start? 1980? Anyway, um, so you've been in power in Zagreb for about a year. What, um, what achievements are you most proud of as a government and what have been your biggest challenges? Well, I mean, there are... Pfft, yeah, that's a very, very hard question. Um, um, yeah, so to um, maybe to name like three of the uh, of the our like core projects that we've been working on. The first one is, you know, as a, as a left uh, political platform, we said that we want to create uh, social uh, social policies and uh, and like redistributive uh, policies that work for you know for the majority of the people. So we are actually. Um, doing uh, quite large projects of um, building uh, kindergartens because kindergartens are the you know the competence of local uh, local um, authorities uh, while you know uh, high schools and uh, um, higher education is the state authority uh, so we've been building like this um, uh, large project of kindergartens where we're trying to say like every child needs an education uh, needs uh, and uh, this also like uh, is a um, goal that serves gender equality because in that sense we will have you know like women relieved of of you know caring duty and uh, care is for us of course quite a, uh, quite an important uh, concept as well so we'll try we are trying to uh, develop like community uh, centers to provide like community uh, community care this is going to be one of our um, uh, large projects uh, as well. The second one uh, is obviously the uh, mm, you know the, the project of green transition, which means uh, a lot of things. We are uh, rebuilding the way we use tra transport, so we are creating more pedestrian zones. Uh, we are doing the solarization of uh, of the roofs of the public buildings in Zagreb, and we are undertaking this huge project, which is something you may, you may not have a problem with uh, currently, but in Zagreb, for example. Uh, Zagreb is, I think, the worst city in Europe regarding uh, waste management um, recycling. Uh, so we are now introducing uh, the waste management syst uh, the system that will increase like uh, the recycling and create circular economy. And this is important for us. I know it sounds like you know this is quite you know some you know it's, it's a small thing. It's really not because if you look at the political system in Croatia, the waste management system has been uh, in Croatia um, uh, not really taken care of and some parts of uh, waste disposal uh, management were taken over by the private companies and we said we, we want to insource it back, we want, we want to take it back to the, pu uh, to the public companies, that's one. And secondly, we really want to reform it in a way that we are a sustainable city. And no government before wanted to do it because like also one, one characteristic of the political space is that it's, be, it's been based on clientelistic relationship of the, of, the, of the main conservative party where actually it's, um, I think that a good term to, uh, to use here is uh, state capture. I don't know if you know, uh, if you're aware of this term where basically the state is run by a, a, by a political party that has uh, loads of private interests that have actually captured the state and no reform gets done because there are no action, because these interests, these private interests don't actually want anything done. So this is like a status quo in Croatian politics has been for years. 
So we are, we are this, the ones who said that, you know, we really have the courage to make these changes because we don't own anything to anyone. We've been a social movement party wanting to really affect uh, reforms and change. And we are willing to, you know, to actually go to, uh, to, to the transformation of the waste management system, to, you know, to green transformation, the transport transformation, building kindergartens, because, you know, we don't, we are not into that kind of a, um, uh, interest-based uh, politics, but you know we're really in there for the public interest, and this is something that people recognize uh, in us, and I think this is uh, this is what uh, makes the, the uh, what uh, you know what makes the difference. Wonderful. <laughs> and so, a short last question. Um, you've mentioned in discussion that the the feminization of politics. Uh, is like quite central to the political project. Um, could you talk a little bit about what that means and what that means in practice in your political party? I mean, the feminization of politics is, uh, when, I th when I come to think about it, is a term that's, um, that's basically, you know, like um, used by a, a group of uh, left-wing people the left-wing people that's been developed in like Barcelona and Comun similar platforms, but I, when I you know think about it more, it really doesn't resonate. You know, that term with you know what uh, uh, with you know the meaning. The meaning is not obvious. You know, for many people. So I decided that uh, um, I should always try to uh, you know ex explain what it means instead of just using terms. You know, one of the things that I'm really um, uh, as as a you know politically active per person that I'm really against is you know like using terms that uh, just like for the sake of the concept is to identify as you know is, is either a left person or a green person but rather to try to explain it um, so basically um, uh, when we say uh, feministization of politics we mean like the way of doing politics which is like you know that uh, politics has um, become more and more personal and you have like political leaders that are um, um, uh, becoming like their own personalities and not you know like being part of the collective so for me uh, the feminist principles uh, are actually the principles of knowledge sharing and the principles of collectivity. So in terms of the knowledge, knowledge sharing, this means including as many people as possible in decision making and policy making and actually you know, understanding the, the, the political project. And on the other hand, to act as a, as a team in whatever comes in a, in a, uh, in, in a way that you do politics. Like, um, um, for example, when we... Uh, the last mayor of Zagreb was known as a, as a strong personality and very, you know, like, corrupt, etc., etc. I will not now talk about him because a lot of people in Croatia know it, but you don't need to know it. But basically, he always functioned, you know, as, a, as you like, you know, this kind of a, a leadership figure, authoritarian figure. And we say, like, our administration uh, and our, you know, political representatives act really as a, as a collective, as a team. And you can see that, you know, that our politics is a collective effort. And that is like the first thing that for me the, uh, this, this notion means. The second one, as I explained, is the knowledge sharing and the kind of a creating of a more horizontal structure for, you know, for people to actually want to participate in politics. So that would mean also like creating citizen assemblies, involving people in, in like in their neighborhoods, in the decision over their neighborhoods. And of course, finally, um, what, you know, what it means is um, bringing more women into politics. This is quite crucial for us, not only, you know, as women, but substantially um, as, you know, a way of creating, a, uh, of, you know, developing a party. So we've spent also a lot of time of, in uh, investing in education, in, you know, like we have a zip model system. I don't know if I probably, you know, what it means. Zip model is, um, um, that means that no list can be created unless it's like uh, uh, there is a parity on the list. So it means that uh, uh, if there is like, uh, uh, if, the, if the first person is a, a man, then you have to have women, men, women. So it's like a zip model where you have to have a parity on the electoral list. So this is how we manage also to bring more women into uh, into politics, into political positions, and also like in terms of uh, of the party structure, we also of course have their like um, uh, quotas for women. So I hope I, I explained it. Wonderful, thank you. Nobody wants to stand up. No, I, I, I'll s sit down in solidarity. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Brilliant. Um, so, Luca, um, let's hear about Slovenia. Can you tell us about the origins of the party that you lead, Levica? Yeah. <coughs> okay. First of all, um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I will try to uh, attach to what the colleagues uh, from Serbia and uh, Croatia had said before. Um, now, um, Slovenia say uh, is a, uh, was um, the luckiest part of um, collapse of Yugoslavia because we managed to escape war. So, uh, communists in uh, Croatia and uh, Serbia turned into nationalists, uh, fierce nationalists who basically uh, blew up the peninsula while communists in Slovenia, because they escaped the war, uh, turned into social democrats. So basically Slovenia was the luckiest part because they transformed the country after 91 more or less into a social democracy shaped after uh, Austria and uh, Germany uh, with uh, um, economic social council, uh, public health care that is still completely, um, almost completely public, uh, uh, public and free education also at the university level, um, a decent uh, welfare state, uh, Financial Times published an article last week showing that uh, the bottom half of the Slovenian population um, lives better in uh, uh, per capita um, parity uh, than uh, the bottom half of the British population, which is quite an achievement for a country that has uh, GDP, say, um, a third lower uh, than you have. So, what I'm saying is that Slovenia was better off, but still, uh, we share many um, experiences. Um, the colleagues said that uh, the new left started bursting in, uh, after the crisis, more or less, after the financial collapse, uh, we were politicized through austerity uh, in uh, Southern Europe and um, we decided, uh, because the, the uh, future looked grim, uh, housing prices were uh, abnormal, um, regular jobs were out of touch, uh, precarity was the way to go, so we decided that we have to do something politically if we want to live in a better world. And that is basically, that was the push to politicize, to build up movements, protest movements, and finally parties. Uh, so that is also the story of Slovenia and of our party, uh, Levica, um, that was uh, um, built in uh, 2012 to 2014, entered the parliament, uh, uh, and we were an opposition party for the last eight years, and now we are a government party since June. But uh, maybe I'll um, say a little bit of more that later. Uh, however, uh, what I am proud of in talking about Balkans is that we are building a true internationalism. Uh, the peninsula was not in a good shape uh, when we um, landed there. Uh, the, um, in my um, uh, childhood, um, the Balkan wars were going on. And when I uh, turned 18, uh, memories of uh, Slobodan Milosevic and Franjo Tudjman were still uh, very alive and kicking. I lived, I'm from a small town uh, uh, in the Alps. Uh, the, 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 the picture of the Balkans was that, for instance, Serbia is like uh, in the Middle Ages. You know, so uh, the political project of uh, Slovenia and the Litz for the last uh, 30 years was escape from Balkans, go to Middle Europa. And if I may end with another um, Zizek joke, um, he said, um, <laughs> he said, uh, but that, that's quite famous, um, uh, uh, that, you know, um, that Balkan doesn't exist. Um, if you are in Croatia, you will say that Balkan, Balkan starts in Serbia. In Slovenia, Balkan starts in Croatia. In Austria, Balkan starts in Slovenia. In Bavaria, Balkan starts in Austria. And in uh, Northern Germany, Balkan starts in uh, Bavaria. So Balkan is always um, the land to your south. Except if you are Greek, Balkan starts to your north. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but I would like to twist uh, that joke. Uh, what we built here, um, when I met Anna, um, 10 years ago for the first time, uh, we were a protest movement back then. It was like my first touch with the uh, um, left as institutionalized politics. 
Um, and uh, the, the comrades from Serbia helped us a lot building our party. Now comrades from Croatia, for instance, um, uh, are teaching us because they are much more better off uh, uh, on local level. Uh, they are ruling the, the city of Zagreb, that is a city almost a million strong. Uh, and they have a mayor there. They have uh, in six months um, uh, aggregated 600 uh, candidates for different uh, municipal functions and that is fascinating in all regards. They are teach teaching us how to perform local politics and we are all learning from each other. For instance, uh, we are not uh, theorizing um, post-capitalist society in uh, abstract terms anymore. Uh, the last time I was on this a month ago on the Croatian island on the Green Academy, we were really talking about how to shape um, public institutions in order to perform um, green transition. So um, I would say that we made uh, a huge progress and we are also bringing the peninsula together. And before, um, when we um, talked with John McDonnell, uh, we were figuring out that uh, the left in Europe, you know, we are not communicating with each other. So we are like reinventing the wheel all the time. So what I wanted to say with that joke, what is Balkans? Um, I would like f that all of us become Balkans. <laughs> Great. We are all Balkans now. Um, so, politically speaking, in terms of, you know, running the country, the Slovenian new left has been the most successful. Um, from going from a protest movement to a, a party in power, what um, I imagine has involved an awful lot of compromises and challenges and you're now part you're now the radical left part of a center left government how how has that been have you managed to achieve things that you've wanted to achieve has has the compromise been worth it yes um <clears throat> well we were um activists then opposition party now government party um i would put it like that when you are an activist um you don't um, bear um public responsibility. So you can push your mm, proposals as far to the left as you want. Um, maybe someone bothers, maybe not. If someone bothers, there will be a fierce public debate, but that's all. When you are uh, an opposition party, um, things change because you have to be aware of um, public opinion. And um, as uh, one uh, theoretician said, uh, that um, politics was always about succession. That is why um, the emperors and so were so, uh, were so um, uh, how to say, so uh, meticulous about their reproduction um, because they wanted to produce a decent air. Uh, in electoral politics, um, the succession means uh, that you are striving to get um, the best result possible. So um, that is the accommodation that you have to, 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 to build in when um, you transform from the movement to a parliamentary party. Uh, now when we are in government, um, the, the things are going more and more complicated because um, there's no, um, not just uh, you and public opinion and uh, the rest of the political field, uh, now, um, being part of the government, it's like um, our ministry via other ministries, um, the relations in the government, in coalition, then you have to be prudent how to hold the, 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 the parliamentary thing together, uh, your party on board, and of course, uh, watch the public opinion. So, um, I'm, in, I'm in a position where um, every word or every remark I make uh, can um, you know, make a, um, a swirl, um, can, can, uh, um, can make a media spin. And uh, I feel very much what uh, the British left experienced um, when Jeremy Corbyn and Tim were uh, in power uh, in the Labour um, Party. Uh, Jeremy Corbyn was uh, the most smeared politician in the history of uh, United Kingdom. Um, I also uh, experienced some very nasty, uh, <laughs> nasty um, uh, uh, spins this summer. And um, what I'm now concerned with uh, when we are talking about reinventing the wheel, uh, if you want to um, 
push socialist politics forward, we will have to learn from each other, uh, not learn just what politics and policies to make, to make but also how to, um, how to um, push the overtone window to the left. Uh, because right now, mm, we are lucky that we have uh, um, uh, left liberal or even social democratic party um, in power. We are junior coalition partner and they are quite keen to take um, uh, our suggestions. When I say public housing, they will say public housing. When we uh, um, uh, demanded um, as one of the key measures to, to show that Slovenia is an open and democratic society, that uh, the fence on the border with Croatia should be removed, they agreed and now we are the, the Slovenian army is removing the fence that was uh, constructed to prevent uh, migrants to, uh, and refugees uh, to, um, to, to bridge the border. It is now removed. Um, when <laughs> Thank you. When we are talking about arms deals, we agreed and we slacked the, the biggest arm deal. Uh, that was uh, worth 400 million euro and so on. So there's a lot of things that we can do, but on the other hand, um, the question is if the center left is willing to do all that, what is left for the socialists? So if we uh, move more further to the left and say, well, uh, we should uh, nationalize the banks, that would be a <laughs> red scare. Uh, and. Um, <coughs> Uh, I believe that not only in Slovenia, um, in all Europe, the left has an ideological problem. That is how to fit in, not, not how to fit in, we, we fit in, uh, we show that we can fit in, we can also be part of the, uh, part of the uh, state power. But um, the question is how to transform the, um, uh, how to say, liberal ideology or the, uh, if I use Zizek again, the, 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 the liberal trash can of ideology that we are eating from with a socialist trash can of ideology that we will be eating from. <laughs> Thanks, Luca. Um, that is the challenge. Uh, okay, Bora. Um, I'm excited to talk about Albania, not least because I went on summer holiday there. Uh, highly recommended. Um, <laughs> So every country we've heard from so far has been uh, an ex-member of Yugoslavia. Uh, Albania was very much not that, uh, and its communist path was quite radically different to that. Um, and also the development of the left has been somewhat, somewhat different to that. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about recent, hi recent history in Albania and like, you know, the, the absolute shit show that the left was facing when, when the student movement stood up on the scene. Hi, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, okay, I will uh, give a very short uh, historical context on what happened uh, uh, during the, after the Second World War in Albania, which was not part of uh, Yugoslavia as the rest of uh, the majority of the countries in the region. And uh, after a very short time, we interrupted any kind of relation, even with the Soviet Union, even with China, and Albania became the most isolated country probably in the whole wild world. Uh, it's, some people might even say that it was the North Korea of, the, of, the, of, of Europe because the country was extremely isolated, uh, highly dogmatic, and if you see different leaders that were uh, in, um, in, in the rest of the, so of the Eastern Bloc in Albania, we only had one specific leader, which was uh, uh, Enver Hoxha, and uh, the system was a, a dictatorship which uh, we also probably were the only country in Europe who faced, uh, who experienced the cultural revolution brought by the Chinese model, which had uh, a, a major impact and uh, it caused a high repression among, uh, among Albanians, among uh, students, the youth, and uh, the so-called, uh, let's say, qualified uh, classes and artists and cultural uh, workers in, in Albania, high purges, uh, People, and also in Albania, people could not even escape. They were not allowed to migrate. They were not allowed to escape the country. Otherwise, they could get killed or uh, imprisoned if they would be catched in the border. Or even if they were successful to escape, their families would be facing persecutions, uh, arrests, uh, uh, and uh, 
so yeah, this is how the level of repression, uh, the, uh, although there were uh, ma massive changes from 1945 from the Communist Party and later the Labour Party, uh, w massive uh, industrialization, the Albania was 95% uh, illiterate in 1945, so we had the first universities in the 50s, so there were these kind of changes, but... Uh, uh, in, in 1991, when the regime fell, uh, it caused this kind of counter-reaction that uh, we are probably the most neoliberal country in the region and uh, people were very happy to embrace neoliberal po policies and uh, the shock doctrine and even when the US ambassador first came in Albania, people went out on the streets to cheer for him and wave for him. So there was this eagerness to become like the West and uh, Privatization in Albania meant development, meant uh, uh, not having public spaces or public sphere anymore, meant that we are going to develop and become like, like Europe. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Coca-Cola was not allowed in Albania until 1991, and if someone would go and have a trip for state reasons and come back, they would bring a bottle of Coca-Cola, and everyone would come for, to pay a visit to this family to look how it was and uh, keep the plastic bottle as a souvenir in, uh, in our uh, living rooms to show to the people that, look, we have a Coca-Cola can or bottle which it's, uh, it's a pity. We, we uh, in Albania, and we were even discussing before that how if, even in the rest of the region, being um, having plastic bottles or plastic bags meant uh, that these countries were developed. We were only using recycled glasses. So it's, you know, the, the level of isolation made people feel so eagerness to bring whatever was from the foreign uh, world and from the West to, to pretend it's, uh, its development. So what, but actually what happened in 1991 was that the whole country collapsed. Uh, this, it went uh, bankrupt. Uh, there was high unemployment because all the industries bankrupt. Massive migration towards the towards the West and uh, or Greece or Italy. People were even um, illegally going through the seas. Like you see, what we see today from Syrian migrants going in the Mediterranean was uh, what the images I grew up in the 90s, seeing people dying in the middle of the seas just to escape the country. And uh, under these circumstances, of course, we cannot speak uh, for, uh, or we cannot pretend that a labor movement would be present, which caused that in the in the 90s and in the 2000s there was, uh, uh, let's say, the the worst period of the of the labor movement uh, because there was not uh, there was not one. Uh, so yeah, uh, just to give you an example on how much being left or even being a social democrat in Albania was considered uh, being a communist, being a, a, a quite extremist. And uh, in, I remember in the beginning of the 90s to show, of, to show that we are ready to, embra to embrace this new area, people would go, of course, organized and influenced by US and the official right-wing party to go and cut orange trees because communism planted them or destroy schools because uh, communism built them. So this was a level of, of, uh, of madness, let's just say it this way. Uh, so what was happening after all this uh, nonsense, uh, the n uh, massive privatizations, neoliberal policies implementation, which made even the Socialist Party, which is uh, so-called socialist, to be the most neoliberal party ever in the history of, uh, of Albania and probably the most neoliberal party in the region. Uh, under these circumstances, this is how my organization was, uh, was uh, founded in um, almost 10 years ago. And uh, yeah, I forgot your question. I spoke about the, the, the historical context and I forgot about you the rest. You forgot my question, but you answered it. Okay. Um, what about you, your, your politicization? So, th so uh, Albania was extremely hostile place to be left wing, but then a new generation of you and your comrades have emerged as left wing. How did that happen? Uh, well, uh, I think everyone has a different personal uh, uh, experience or perspective. I don't know how I became political or left, uh, left leaning. I sometimes think I had no chance. I was grown, I was raised by four grandparents which were uh, part of the anti-fascist struggle and uh, probably it has caused a major impact on the way I was, uh, I was uh, raised. But it can also be sometimes walking in the streets and the as a kid and you 
uh, you see people who are begging in the on the streets and they have no not even a fireplace or a blanket and you go back home and uh, your house uh, is quite quite warm or it can be that you are in the universities and you see that your uh, your friends who are not from the capital but have moved from the periphery to come and study in the in Tirana they can't afford to buy books or they eat just once per day because of the level of poverty so i don't know what specifically impacted me but i know that for sure it was uh, a moment i decided that i'm not going to leave the country which was 21st of january 2011 i was a high school student it was a protest uh, called back then by the opposition, the so-called Socialist Party, which after the protest they betrayed the protesters. Uh, it was about the video corruption where the deputy prime minister it was recorded demanding 7% of an agreement, like it was so clear and he pretended the video was fake, of course. Uh, and it, w it made a lot of people go to the protest. I was a high school student, I went there without asking even per permission from my parents. And uh, I remember it was it was quite a tense protest and just a few meters from where I was standing, a protester got shot by the, by the police and the, the army and uh, it was a complete chaos and when I went back home I realized that four, uh, three other people were killed in the protest. It was the first time that in Albania, not even when the regime fell, uh, these kind of things happened. So this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, repression uh, was uh, a moment that some other people made them feel more scared or leave, but I don't know, to me it, it gave another counter effect that I knew that I was not uh, going to give up. And uh, uh, luckily I started to become uh, more active in social media and realized that because of this protest, my comrades, lecturers in the university and other people decided to found uh, Organizata Politica, which was uh, my organization now, and the leftist the grassroots organization which uh, didn't only be, was oppo opposing the official right-wing government, but also opposing the neo neoliberal uh, opposition who betrayed the, the people protesting. Actually, the four protesters, it's not a coincidence, the four people who got shocked were poor people. And none of the MPs of the opposition was present. They escaped when they noticed that things were becoming tough. So yeah, that's, uh, but as time went by, I started to be engaged. We had to found the student movement. We never had a tradition, not only when it comes to labor organizing, but even in the student movement, we didn't have a tradition because the universities were founded in the 50s and uh, it was only in 1991 for when for the first time students went uh, in the streets when the regime fell and for 30 years nothing was happening. So we had to found the student movement to oppose the neoliberal policies uh, in higher education because the government pr was pretending to implement a successful Anglo-Saxon model on higher education with students' debt and uh, which was not okay at all because it probably as Anna mentioned before, uh, uh, we in before the 90s, uh, the educa higher education was the only way to have the social mobility for uh, thousands and thousands of people. So we decided that we are going to 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 do this, and we oppose these policies until uh, which led to massive students uprising in uh, December 2018. The whole for a whole month, students were in the streets, which made the government beg for us to go to negotiate. And although the law is still uh, let's say, uh, in, in power, practically they never managed to implement it. So that was the moment. And from uh, that moment on, I've been engaged in labor organizing because that moment specifically triggered and gave hope even to workers who actually reached us to start and uh, this organizing process for new, for new independent trade unions. Uh, so if I can also add another thing which I forgot about the context, just to give an example, our prime minister, which is the so-called socialist uh, prime minister and uh, uh, leader of the socialist party, has an advisor, Tony Blair, since 2013. And uh, in 2015, he used to call in Italian talk shows uh, the Italian investors to come to Albania and to invest because there are no trade unions. And when he openly states that, can you imagine what it's actually happened with the with the labor rights in Albania, where people die constantly in construction uh, sites in the middle of the city center in, ter in the capital and uh, in mines. And uh, so, and I'm not even going to start about the level of wages and exploitation, but just, uh, just this, yeah.
wonderful. Thank you, Bora, and thank you to all the panel for all those little snapshots of, of your context and struggles. Um, the bit now is where we have a discussion. I always like these bits. I always dream that these bits are going to be just like a chat in the pub. Sometimes it's a bit more awkward. But I do have some prompts. Um, uh, but I also wondered if you had any questions for, e for each other or any responses. But if you don't, that's also fine. Sometimes in the pub you need a prompt. Okay, great. Um, so the support base of the new left, the voter base of the new left. So one thing that we haven't really talked about, but I think is is the case, is that generally the 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 new left in the Balkans, um, and this has echoes of some things that were said about uh, the 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 Corbyn movement, um, was largely educated people in cities, you know, like including migrants and stuff like that, but like generally like educated, precarious middle class. Um, so what, across your different contexts and like different stages of party party building or, or, or union building and so on, um, how much have you managed to find common cause with, you know, the large traditional uh, industrial working class populations that are still in your country or people who like live more on the peripheries of your country and less in the major cities? I can start because I'm the most guilty. Um <laughs> 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 yeah, as you said, uh, our voting base is more or less uh, educated, urbanite, young. That's it. Um, but on the other hand, what is interesting is that we were appealing to the um, class interests all the time. So uh, we managed to um, uh, raise minimum wage by, say, 30% in the last three or four years uh, because we um, implemented a law in the previous mandate when we were collaborating with the uh, centuries government um, and, uh, how to say, um, one of the one of the conditions for our collaboration was um, that we uh, redefine minimum wage, and we said, okay, minimum wage should be um, minimum living costs. We have a national cal calculation made every uh, three years, uh, plus 20% on top, and we adopted the law. So now the minimum wage jumped from. Uh, I believe it was about 900 euros gross to 1,200 euros gross in the uh, last three years. So people, uh, the, 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 the poorest uh, employees, are, um, um, have, ben have benefited by a third um, because of our policies. At the same time, we managed to um, raise um, uh, minimum um, social benefits by a third. Uh, we managed to close uh, all shops on Sundays. So that means that uh, tens of thousands of workers who are working in uh, shops have free Sundays. However, that didn't translate into political support for our party. It didn't. Uh, when we came to the elections, other topics prevailed and we were stuck um, to urban centers, young and educated. So um, class interests, and identification are two different things. And uh, unfortunately, the right wing understands that much more than we do. Uh, for instance, and I once read how Orban decided uh, he was, um, uh, how to say, uh, um, he was a liberal back in the 90s, and uh, he was appealing to the middle classes of, um, of uh, Hungary. He even won elections uh, in the late 90s and ran a government that collapsed. And after that, he decided to reshuffle his politics. And he said, okay, basically I'm not from Budapest, even though I live here. I was born in a small town 40 kilometers north of Budapest. And he uh, started to um, appeal on his origins. Then he started to dress uh, not as, as a... Um, a businessman from, uh, um, from Budapest, but uh, as a small uh, businessman from his hometown. Uh, shiny, uh, 
shiny dresses, um, bad taste, and so on. So he was like, when, when, when he walked into a um, pre-electoral show, all the people were like, what the fuck? <laughs> but it, it worked. It worked. He started to appeal um, to the, say, um, small businesses and working classes um, around Hungary, especially because he um, turned his guns towards Budapest. So Budapest and uh, Brussels were guilty for their low wages, their suffering, um, their uh, misfortunes, and so on. And uh, he invented the boogeyman. Uh, and so in identification plus, um, how to say, uh, a very well um, uh, profiled um, big other worked for him. And on the left, I believe we have uh, problems with both. Um, who's the opponent and what is the identity with which we are trying to appeal to the working classes. Um, I would be more provocative here and say that uh, when we are talking about working classes, um, we um, sound retro. Um, uh, as talking like people who are stuck somewhere between the first and the second industrial revolution, trying to save the, the worker so the mine will not collapse on his head or uh, some engine um, uh, working on steam will not consume him. But the working classes are now, uh, as we all know, uh, much different uh, than those imaginary um, uh, pictures uh, that uh, uh, some of our comrades would like to evoke. So we will have to, to find an answer and here I'm uh, once again appealing to uh, international left because also the left in Slovenia doesn't have a clear answer to that. If we had, we would be the ruling party, not the junior coalition party. Um, that we must um, find that uh, those identification points. How to, not, not just with policies and um, uh, appealing to class interest, but by identification appeal to the working classes. That is the, the task uh, ahead of us. Okay, so um, yeah, we also have a voter base in uh, larger cities in, uh, in Croatia. But uh, I think that what is interesting is that uh, our, our voter base is uh, a result of our, um, our work for many years, basically. Um, so it's kind of a, uh, let's say, oh, like an or to some extent organic uh, base, not, I mean, not quite, but uh, basically how we developed as a party is that when we built a national party, we didn't build it, uh, uh, you know, just like let's start as a national party, but we gathered all the progressive uh, initiatives uh, from different cities that have been fighting, uh, I don't know, against uh, uh, golf courses in uh, Dubrovnik uh, that were fighting against the privatization of, um, of uh, public spaces in Istria, that were in Zagreb working with unions. So we had like this, this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, start as uh, like, an, uh, uh, like our national party was formed by our uh, different uh, community groups, let's put it like that, like different municipal groups. And I think that is also the way of um, extending, you know, your, uh, your uh, party vote, basically. Which means um, that I think that uh, the more we deal with concrete problems that people have, you know, in our neighborhoods, uh, the more we will uh, succeed in getting uh, more votes. It's just a matter of, you know, working a lot uh, with people uh, on solving, you know, different problems on the ground. And I think that's what makes, um, uh, that's what the left is, all, uh, that's what the left is all about. And uh, there, there was this saying by, um, I don't now remember whom, uh, but uh, that person said like uh, neighborhoods are the new factories and I think that there is something in it because this is the way, you know, we organize now and uh, this is the way, you know, the, the organization uh, grows strong. So the way we spread is, you know, through uh, specific communities. And, uh, you know, when I was young, I thought uh, younger, younger, because I still consider myself as a millennial. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> so when I was younger and uh, without back ache, 
you know, I thought, you know, that, uh, um, mm, you know, I like, let's, let's, you know, change the, the world. And now I'm thinking, you know, let's change the neighborhoods first, you know, let's change our communities first. And I think, yeah, basically this is, I think that this is the way, uh, this is the way to grow and to have like strong, strong party structures uh, as well, which are then, you know, formed from this. Um, uh, in Zagreb, when we built a platform, we built it as a platform of all the active citizens who wanted to join. They didn't have to be party members. They just had to, you know, have the uh, will to uh, to want, uh, you know, to want to, uh, uh, you know, tra transform their city. So this is how we started. So uh, this might be the answer, but of course the, uh, the road is very, you know, long and windy. Um, I mean, um, when we came to power in Zagreb, uh, we didn't expect an earthquake, which almost, you know, which really devastated the city. So we came, you know, to power and we had to deal with an earthquake which was really like a scary experience and a very devastating experience for the city. We had also COVID-19. Then we thought, you know, okay, so finally, you know, COVID kind of, uh, you know, at least slowed down a bit. You know, the earthquake, hopefully let's not have an earthquake again. And then, you know, we have inflation and the gas crisis. So, oh, yeah, so. <laughs> So it's like uh, one thing is when you start off, you know, trying to um, make a lot of uh, uh, changes, and the other thing is when you come to real politics. But maybe you know we can talk a bit uh, about it a bit later. Uh, well, we are not an electorate. Uh, we are not a party yet, so it, I don't think that we have. Uh, a very clear, uh, how do you say, uh, knowledge about our, because Navan is voting for us, so we cannot really tell, but one of the fewest things that I'm proud of uh, my organization and our work is the fact that different, uh, comparing to the other leftist groups or parties, as I know so far, we are not only, we are not getting support only from middle class or universities, of course, we have a support uh, by, by the students and uh, because most of us have uh, this student background and we started to become activists due to our student uh, activi uh, movement engagement. But uh, since the country is extremely poor and uh, even students nowadays, they are half students, half workers. So uh, they are, it might be call center workers or waiters or uh, working in different, or working in uh, as receptionist uh, on, on their third shift, but they are studying in the, in the morning, so it's like half students, half workers, uh, activists, militants, but also supporters or members around us. And it also depends on the area where we have support. If we go to Dibra region, where you had your vacation for, I still don't understand why, <laughs> uh, in that area, uh, or uh, it's a, a, minor, a mining town, uh, and we mostly have, well not mostly, uh, we have support from the working class there, or if we go to other industrial towns in the oil refining area, they are small towns, of course, but we have support by the working class there. In Tirana, as far as we know, we, it's funny, we can be on the streets uh, spreading leaflets about minimum basic income or so the other social rights, and other like people might stop us and they are like, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, I'm a right wing. With right wing, they mean anti-communist and whatever happened before, but they identify themselves as, as right wing, and they're like, if you decide to run for election, we are gonna vote for you because you are not, you don't look corrupt, you look so brave, and you are not uh, linked as every party with the mafia and the organized crime. So although you look like some kind of communist, we are gonna vote for you, and uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. But of course that, uh, let's say more in details so when it comes to our program or our activity in, de in details are mostly people in the capital because this is where our activity is mostly, mostly based beside the working class towns that we have been organizing. Uh, last, uh, I forgot in the, in the periphery we are trying to work a lot with uh, in the periphery, there are a lot of textile and garment factories which ha we have been organizing, but also try to raise uh, this kind of community issues and uh, women's rights. And because we are facing this issue that women are not organized, are not engaged in the trade union activity due to their for 
several reasons that we all know why. And uh, we are really trying to, to do community work so we can get closer to them and uh, be in touch with women who can also come from peripheria, they are not educated and they are workers. So we are also trying to tackle this dimension. Brilliant. Let's take some questions from the floor. Maybe I'll take a few. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, well, thanks everyone for, I mean, you've addressed so many. I'm actually from Serbia, so I mean, it makes sense that it was very interesting to me. And especially what Luca mentioned about dissociation sort of of the left from the working classes. I think that's a very important topic in Serbia about uh, Moramo. But anyways, I wanted to ask uh, the three of you, because Bora mentioned the problem in Albania with the association of, of the left wing in general with communism in a negative sense. So I wanted to ask you, how are you guys coping with the legacy of Titoism? I mean, is that, mm, can, do you think there's some kind of Mm, something progressive in it, or do you have to cut the ties completely, uh, like you know, Bora mentioned it with communism in Albania? Thanks again. Who's next, please? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I kind of wanted to ask something similar, but I also wanted to ask. Um, about the place of sort of um, minority movements within your politics. I went to uh, Europride in uh, Serbia uh, last week, and you know, there's some really interesting tension between um, sort of like queer and LGBT sort of left wing activists, and then a more sort of liberal approach to um, LGBT politics. Uh, and Serbia, of course, has like an openly lesbian president, uh, prime minister. Um, who is also a member of a sort of quite right-wing governing party. Um, and then, you know, you have quite a lot of, like, um, nationalist and um, religious uh, opposition to LGBT politics there. Um, so I wondered, like, how much in particular LGBT politics uh, comes into your movements, um, given the like, level of hostility that they draw from the right. Hi everyone, uh, just for context, um, I work in the NHS as a trade union organizer, but I'm also a member of Levita, uh, so we're basically comrades with Look, I'm a double insider, what you could say. Um, so Slovenia was spared from the so-called shock doctrine, uh, so that means uh, we had a slower privatization, uh, and the victory at the last election was important also because of that. So we prevented the further dismantling of state ownership, the welfare state, and so on. But my concern is that, obviously, working in the NHS and seeing what's being done to the NHS by outsourcing and, you know, basically carving out all the profitable bits, is COVID could be a good opportunity for the private sector to have the foot in the door in the Slovenian healthcare system. And what are we doing to sort of not, you know, make the same mistakes that Britain did, namely to sort of allow the idea of, you know, free at the point of views, but, you know, still allowing the private sector to run parts of uh, the public healthcare system. Because we can, as you said, you, we can sort of try to shift the narrative to the left, to actual socialism, because now we're talking about social democracy, and we did a lot of, you know, good things so far. But the threat is still there, namely some private insurance companies are building a private hospital at the moment, which is unprecedented. So I think that is, you know, apart from all the successes there, the, this is one of the big challenges that, you know, we should address in Slovenia as well. Great, thank you everyone. And also hilarious, because I was telling the panel before that people won't have that much knowledge about the Balkans, but the first questions we get are <laughs> <laughs> very insider questions from people who grew up there. Brilliant. Um, answer whichever ones you want. Actually, I don't feel very confident in, about in talk, uh, talking about the, the, the positions of the Mora, Mora coalition or, uh, or any particular 
uh, organization which is a member of this co coalition, but I, what I can say th as the is that the minority questions, sexual minority questions are definitely a part of the agenda of the left and has always been. And regarding the, the rights of sexual minorities in Serbia, this is also like um, one, yeah, one of th the consequence of these processes which I was a little bit describing, like of a uh, rise of the clerical uh, right wing, which is, for example, uh, directed against the m sexual minority rights in Serbia, but th th they are more uh, the, the, the same clerical uh, uh, right wings in Croatia, for example, are attacking the reproductive rights. And yeah, so uh, in I, I somehow think that the right wingers uh, are always choosing um, a scapegoat which they will attack, uh, uh, and it's a little bit different from one country to another. But yeah, this is the greatest challenge we are we are facing as a left. Yeah, and also like um, um, uh, uh, um, one should always bear in mind, at least in Serbia, that we have a very clever and cunning uh, 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 president, which is um, which is using uh, and do uh, which is which is which is controlling media, which is, which is, uh, and, and also like using this kind of issues to produce like uh, chaos. And um, you've been there, you saw how it, how it ends. And uh, in the end, um, when you are, spec when you're, you, you're just observing what is happening, you are, you are having also an impression that you are in some staged uh, conflicts and so on. So the challenge of the left is actually to move uh, from this fake conflictual situation and to find the connecting points between the, 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 the common people who are now following some kind of religious uh, leaders, uh, yeah, and to explain that the conflict doesn't lie uh, uh, between us but uh, on s uh, in some other place. Okay, so uh, first, uh, how much LGBT politics come into your movements? Uh, well, uh, we are openly supporting LGBT rights, of course, as a left green party. Our mayor was and is, is, is. Uh <laughs> <laughs> the man is uh, 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 luckily still alive and uh, doing a great job. So. Uh <laughs> Uh, he's the first one, uh, the first mayor uh, to come to Zagreb Pride. Uh, so with the whole uh, city administration and, uh, and the city uh, councillors. So we are very much uh, open about this. But at the same time, of course, the, the creation political space as well, as you know, the whole, <laughs> it's, I mean, <laughs> It's not very, you know, like, um, a to uh, it's not still a very tolerant uh, society, I would say, in terms of LGBT rights. But what, o what is also a problem for me is that, you know, the right wing is always trying to use, like, you know, the left wing. They are, like, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to create a political divide that's based on, um, like, uh, identification. Either are you pro or LGBT rights? And we said, look, we are openly pro LGBT rights. Uh, totally supporting and there are also other issues that we are you know like dealing with and uh, that's that because they're trying to say like you know we are the one who own the whole the social space like the social rights the you know the the right wing is doing that you know while the left uh, is, is dealing with Tito they basically you know that's why they say like the the left wing is dealing with you know the past the Tito they're dealing with LGBT rights well they're not dealing with you know the um, you know the what the majority of the pa of the population suffers from, and we are saying like, yeah, we are dealing with both, and this is what the modern you know green left is 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 doing. So this is uh, very important to us. Uh, but at the same time, like uh, uh, now to to go to the question about Tito. Um, uh, to be honest, I mean like um, uh, every time we talk about you know the Balkan politics, uh, Tito comes up, and the really. You know, like I think that people in Croatia really have like, uh, or in the Balkans really have like, you know, big uh, issues in terms of, you know, social security, in terms of healthcare, in terms of, you know, like economic crisis, earthquake, et cetera, et cetera. 
and this is also something that the right wing is, is insisting on like you know let's talk about Tito shall we move like we had like a, a whole discussion about like will we name one square the Tito square or not Tito square and then you know like it's like you know like I don't think this is really you know <laughs> Like we said, like uh, uh, we are fine, you know, with uh, naming the square, Tito, but we will not be doing it as one of our priorities because it's not a priority for, you know, for the lives of the uh, of the majority of people. And I think, you know, that's you know that's what distinguishes the contemporary, uh, you know, left green politics. Um, um, yeah, I just don't want like I really don't want to talk about Tito. Yeah, so that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, in Slovenia, we also don't talk about Tito, <laughs> um, even though uh, Tito was not Hoja. So uh, there were lots of uh, how to say um, positive um, um, instances in uh, Yugoslavian and Slovenian socialism that we can appeal on. Uh, Self-management, Slovenia was, I believe, the 10th most industrialized country uh, when the socialism collapsed. Um, some uh, architectural and uh, urbanist um, achievements are remarkable still of today. Um, uh, architectural stu students come to Ljubljana and to Slovenia to see them, uh, to cities will build anew and uh, they were like uh, um, role models or blueprints how a modern city should be built. So um, uh, welfare state and so on, uh, health system and so uh, was functioning. Uh, so there, there's not a lot of fuss about that. However, um, the right wing is anti-communist in Slovenia and is building its agenda um, on anti-communism, has been building uh, its agenda on anti-communism for the last 30 years. Uh, but basically they focus on two instances. Uh, the first is um, nationali nationalization after the war, and the second is um, recession and uh, uh, a lack of uh, empty shelves, basically, um, when Yugoslavia started collapsing. So um, those are basically the um, acupuncture points that they point to when somebody starts talking about socialism. Ah, you will nationalize and your economic system will collapse and we will have empty shelves again. So that is basically the, the things that you are trying to avoid uh, when talking about socialism in Slovenia. Uh, but uh, there are not uh, many other issues. However, when we come to a uh, health system, mm -hmm. we have a, a health system that is basically 90% uh, public uh, and free. Uh, you also don't pay admittances and so on when you, you come to your personal doctor. So it's completely free. Um, but the problem is that uh, the health system is overburdened with patients. Um, people are more and more aware of their um, health. You know, people today are much more, how to say, uh, prone to go to the doctor than they were 50 years ago. For instance, my grandfather, he never visited a doctor. I mean, how can something be wrong with uh, him, his perfect body? So, <laughs> 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 so uh, uh, um, on the consumer side, um, so to say, uh, the patients, uh, uh, the people of uh, uh, in Yugoslavia were much less demanding patients than we are today. We have to admit that. Uh, so, um, what is burdening our health system right now is uh, waiting lines. Then can be that can be uh, really heavy. Mm. You can wait a year or two for some uh, procedures. And the right wing is pinpointing again, okay, you have a, a socialist healthcare system. What did you expect? There are waiting lines. Uh, so the calls are, of course, for um, introducing market instruments in it and so on. Uh, however, the current coalition is, not, is trying not to go that way, even though um, health minister has some... Uh, odious ideas, but we will do our best to keep the system public, but uh, to make it functional uh, in a public sphere. And that is a huge demand, and uh, that will be one of the biggest tasks in, uh, this, uh, in this government to achieve that.
uh, in uh, since we were uh, founded, of course, we had a clear position when it comes to human rights and LGBT rights are human rights. So uh, there, th it was out of discussion. Uh, this is a topic, and uh, we have always been very present every time prides were organized uh, or a different protests. And uh, even in 2016, we won the our organization won the Alley of the Year uh, of, of, of from the community, which was a, a great honor, and. Uh, I know that it's something that it's it's constantly used by the right wing, by uh, all our opponents. That and it used to be historically like even with the during the anti-fascist struggles, the fact that there were a lot of women who joined the anti-fascist resistance, they were considered as whores and uh, just because they were staying in the same room with men. But even nowadays, Joe knows, even just because I was with men organizing in, in mines, they still use that as an excuse to say, look at that whore, she's in the street. Why doesn't she, has a husband? doesn't she have a husband, but she comes here in the middle of nowhere just because she's a woman. So I don't think that uh, if we wouldn't be supporting the community, things would be different. So, uh, but of course we try to be maturely when it comes to organizing. When I'm organizing in the mines, which is a, a very conservative area, uh, extremely uh, conservative area, uh, uh, very religious, and uh, when they, it's not a topic that I would want to raise when I'm organizing there because it's not the main issue, why it's not the issue actually why I'm there. So we try to organize and identify the issues. For example, it's very difficult to explain to them why I'm an atheist. And uh, I have noticed that sometimes people look at you a very skeptical way. So there are certain topics that it's not clever to raise in that specific moment. But if they ask me or they have seen me or my comrades' pictures and sometimes they're angry towards us, like, how could you do this to us? We didn't know you are going to prides. We thought we were on the same team. And uh, of course, you don't tell them they're homophobic or uh, that what they think is wrong because I, d I don't believe in this kind of uh, a a messiah or emancipatory position that I'll show you what is right, but we try to explain that we believe in these things, we believe that human this is a matter of human rights, if it's wrong, I try to use uh, religious arguments that who are you to judge them, if there is a God, he's going to judge them later, so let's just, uh, <laughs> let's so you try to use, because there's nothing else you can do and uh, we strongly are uh, uh, openly and even we try to organize events in our social center but of course not trying to let's 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 just put it this way not in the ver very first time that someone comes to our so social center we are like you are a homophobe if someone makes a comment like this or you are a localist or you are a fascist like i don't believe in this kind of uh, attitude even when people make uh, pejorative comments in the first times we really try to explain or to set examples or to show uh, and it was funny because uh, there were moments that the miners were against and uh, I remember I I recalled them that there were people from the LGBT, LGBT community who have uh, given contributions while they were on strike or you know trying to give this kind of examples and you see that things are changing very slowly, but they are changing, and I, I certainly believe in that. Uh, when it comes to cut the ties, we are very uh, clear when it comes to cut the ties with uh, the Hojais regime, with the Stalinist regime, which we also blame for, even for the fact that it has given to the left and to the whole, what happened in the 90s, that people actually went mad uh, for anything related to the public sphere. But uh, we whenever is uh, as Elena said this discussion about uh even when i'm in the university i remember in 2014 demanding free public education was considered to be a communist and i had students state students not <laughs> not the government stating no no we just we just don't want the tuition to be increased but we don't want free public education because we don't want communism back. And that's very difficult because you only have five minutes to have their attention. And uh, on the meantime, you have people from the political parties yelling, you're a communist, you're a communist, we told you. And you are like, no, I am not a communist. I uh, do believe I'm a student activist and I believe in free public education. And also Germany is uh, a capitalist country and they have free public education. So it's very difficult to to raise this question, so to, uh, even to raise the questions, but it was a pleasure to see in 2018, I had a loudspeaker in the middle of the crowd 
uh, 20,000, 30,000 people were there and I was yelling decrease the tuition and at some point I had students starting to cheer free public education and I was like overwhelmed. I, I'd never uh, expect that to happen in such a short period in less than four years. Um, there are what we try to do when there are every time there are attempts to, to discuss about Hoza and the system and what should we do with the communist movies and the communist books and author should we cancel everything and uh, they invite us, they know what we believe in, so they try to invite us in these talk shows, so we are like, sorry, this is not our priority, we are not going to discuss about it. If you have anything to debate about oligarchs, privatizations, social welfare and everything, feel free to invite us, but, uh, so yeah. <laughs> Uh, brilliant. That un unfortunately, because we ran a little bit over time, we could only do one round of questions. Um, but um, I hope you found that as interesting as I did. We will be here after the session ends if you want to come up and have a chat. And also, I'm pretty sure we'll all be at the party later so we can have more chats about the Balkans then. Can I just have a big hand for the panel? Yelena, Anna, Luca and Bora. Yeah.